Now it is the time for lighting up the traditional oil lamp. I cordially invite Engineer Jayavilal Megoda, President IESL, Engineer Professor Mrs. Niranjani Ratnayaka, President-elect IESL, two past presidents, Professor Lakshman Ratnayaka, Engineer Priyal De Silva, Mr. Tilan Vijay Singha, the guest speaker, family members of Dr. Kula Singha, Engineer Mene Samad, Chairman, Civil Engineering Section Committee, IESL. Please remain standing. Now, now I cordially invite President Megoda to garland Dr. Kulasinghe's uh, photograph. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Dear President, Mr. Vijay Singh, Engineer Samad, you are kindly invited to the stage. Next item. Welcome and by Engineer Jayavilal Migoda, President elect, oh, sorry, President of ISL. Over to you, sir. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mr. Dilan Vijay Singh, our speaker today. Uh, Relatives of uh, past president uh, engineer Dr. N. S. Kula Singha, uh, Mrs. Tilak Vijay Singha, past president of uh, our uh, wife of our past president uh, engineer Tilak Vijay Singha, past presidents, council members, fellow members, media members from the media, dear friends. The Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka as the apex body for the engineering profession of Sri Lanka commemorates the birth anniversaries of engineering grades the country has produced and Deshabandhu Vidya Jyoti Dr. Engineer Ayrnes Kulasinghe's name is etched in its engineering history. The ISL has added honor of having Dr. Kulasinghe as its president during 1969-70 sessions. We are pleased to commemorate his 98th birth anniversary as we have done in the past several years. Late Dr. A. N. S. Kulasinghe was born October 1919. He entered the Ceylon Technical College to study the B.Sc. in Engineering. Graduated in 1936, he gained Associate Membership of the Institution of Civil Engineers. His illustrious career started in 1940 when he joined the Norton Bridge Hydropower Project as a Technical Assistant. 
In 1944, he joined Colombo Harbor as a junior assistant engineer. In 1962, he became the founder chairman and general manager of the State Engineering Corporation of Ceylon while serving as director of State Hardware Corporation, Ceylon Steel Corporation, Lanka Leyland Limited, Colombo Low Line Areas Reclamation Board, Ceylon Tire Corporation, and council member of Ceylon Bureau of Standards, member board of Vidya Lankara University. He was the chairman of CECB Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau for 18 years. Dr. Kulasinghe is one of the greatest engineers that Sri Lanka has produced. He was a strong advocate of the use of indigenous human resources for the country's development and firmly believed that Sri Lankan engineers are second to none in their talents and capabilities to undertake projects of any complexity. He himself had trailblazed the use of many new technologies in the many projects he had to his credit. The Kulasinghe CPC system of pre-stressing concrete system of large diameter concrete piling developed in 1951 for the construction of port structures including the novel method of floating out and sinking the cylinders are among them. The world-renowned scientific fiction writer Sir Arthur C. Clarke, in his message for the Dr. Kulasinghe Felicitation Volume of the History of Engineering in Sri Lanka, Volume Series, published by the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, has written, In the years following independence in 1948, Ceylon produced some of the brightest and cleverest scientists and engineers in the British Commonwealth, and it has been my privilege to meet and interact with many of them. Dr. Kulasinghe was certainly one, but what set him apart from most of his contemporaries was that he believed in self-reliance and indigenous innovation. Trained and imbibed in the best engineering and technological traditions of the West, he strove to find local solutions for local problems, drawing on local skills and resources. Today, we have engineer Tilan Vijay Singh, son of one of our great past president, late engineer Tilak Vijay Singh. He is the chairman of National Agency for Public-Private Partnerships to deliver the Dr. Kulasinghe Memorial Lecture on relevance, public-private partnership and the role of engineers. Mr. Tilan Vijay Singh has been an exemplary leader of both private and public sector organizations and also successful entrepreneur and angel in investor. Tilan has had a successful track record in investment banking and real estate. In the early 1990s, he co-founded Asia Capital PLC, which became Sri Lanka's largest investment bank at that time. In September 1995, Tilan was invited to become the youngest ever chairman of the Board of Investment Sri Lanka. As the chairman BOI, he pioneered PPP transactions when he set up the Bureau of Infrastructure Investments of the BOI in 1996. The BII closed $800 million in PPP transactions that included SAGT, South Asia's first port sector BOT, private power generation for the first time totaling around 400 megawatt of thermal and 75 megawatt of mini hydro, attracting competition to fix telephone telephony for the first time, Lanka Bell and Suntel. Upon leaving the BOI, Tilan ran Sri Lanka's two largest listed property companies, Asian Hotels Property PLC, where he represented the interest of shareholders who sold the company to John Kills and later Overseas Realty PLC. During the last decade, Tilan co-founded and became shareholder of several pioneering businesses. These include Ceylon Tea Trails, the world's only tea plantation resort connected by walking trails which is majority owned by Dilma. He also founded uh, WOW.LK, Sri Lanka's largest online mall, and E-Treat MD, a Sri Lankan-founded digital health company in Canada. He has degrees in industrial engineering, economics, and business from State University of New York and Cornell University. Over to you, Mr. Tadar.
<coughs> President of IASL, Engineer Jaivilal Migoda, Engineer Nia Samad, thank you for this invitation. Members of the Kulasinga family, distinguished engineers, invitees and ladies and gentlemen. As mentioned, I come from a family of engineers. My immediate family obviously was my father, a civil engineer, and my uncle, Dr. B. M. A. Balasurya, whom I'm told was a, one of the best structural engineers this country has produced. However, we had an extended engineering family. And prime most in that extended family was Dr. N. S. Kulasinga, where I used to call him Kulasinga Mama, and Upul and Harith used to call my father Biscuit Mama. I remember as a child riding a bicycle in his estate in Chaila, and also noticing, despite his many achievements, the simplicity with which he carried out his life. Five years ago, I had the privilege of revisiting the Batagama estate, this time along with Harith and my father, and walking the length and breadth of this estate to try and figure out, just as much as I helped create a hotel called Tea Trails, whether we could create a Cinnamon Trails. And that is when I learned that Dr. Kulasinga, apart from his scientific achievements, was also passionate about preserving the tradition, the 600 year old tradition on cultivating cinnamon. <clears throat> and finally my memories go back to the fascination both Dr. Kulasinga and my father had for the tabla. If I remember right, my father used to hum some tunes, not always to key and Dr. Kulasinga playing the tabla. I did try and learn the tabla myself, but didn't have the sort of patience that he did, but nevertheless uh, went on to play a few other instruments. On that introductory note, I would like to move to the topic of which I am entrusted to, to, to speak to you today, and that is the relevance from an economic perspective of public-private partnerships and the role of engineers as stakeholders in forging and implementing successful public-private partnerships. Again, I'm apologizing for not having a written down speech. I normally do not do that, but I will do so after somebody is recording this speech and uh, it's primarily on account of time constraints. Nevertheless, I hope I can impart to you the economic benefits of PPPs and the significant role that you as engineers can play in the economic development of this country by being stakeholders in the PPP process. Let me start by first making a definition of what a PPP is as there is often confusion in that, in that regard. A public-private partnership is a special contractual arrangement between a public entity or authority and a private entity for providing a public service or asset in which the private party bears significant investment risk and management responsibility. It's that latter part of the sentence that is most important. It is the private sector that makes the investment. Now, what makes it a partnership? A typical factory that is exporting or selling in the local market is not a PPP. A company that signs a lease agreement with the government is not a PPP or a board of investment agreement. A public-private partnership is usually governed by a very complex agreement that would define the risks and responsibilities that the private sector would undertake and defines the risks and responsibilities of the government. It is therefore fundamentally a risk-sharing business enterprise where the government bears some level of risk but usually not investment risk. If at all the government does bear a risk, it would be providing some form of common infrastructure. Now, whilst I do not wish to provide you with a lecture on economics, there are significant benefits 
in pursuing public private partnerships as you are aware it's savings and investment that drives an economy savings of individuals corporates whether it's state or government owned and these savings along with tax revenue are invested in various projects now typically the wait i'm just checking my slides yes typically there are several types of investment that constitute public private partnerships however for me to emphasize the importance of ppps we must first look at this slide as you can see during the course of the last 30 to 40 years sri lanka's debt level as a percentage of gdp has in certain years exceeded 100% and in certain years been in the range of about 75 to 80% which is where it's at at the present moment if you look at the orange chart that is revenue and grants also as a percentage of gdp which has hovered at around 20% or more in the 1950s and 60s and dramatically reduced to about 11% in 19 uh, 2015 and uh, 14 and now at the level of about 14% of gdp and you can see the trend is declining now this has more than anything else contributed to the slowing down of growth now growth has slowed down primarily on account of the fact that our gdp rate growth rate as you can see from the red line has averaged around 5% and our trade deficit has been at around 8 to 10% of gdp and whenever the trade deficit and the gdp growth rate widens as you can see we have had to go to the imf with a begging bowl this happened in 2001 this happened in 2009 and it happened again in 2016 and why we have to go to the imf for a begging bowl are the consequences of the widening of the trade deficit is our export performance and our foreign direct investment performance which has been less than optimum over the last 10 to 15 years and here again i'd like to show you this slide where in the year 2000 sri lanka's exports of services and goods as a percentage of gdp was at 39 percent in the year 2000 it has declined to 21 percent in the year 2014 whereas in the other countries such as vietnam malaysia and singapore it's either increased or remained more or less static or at a level significant in terms of a percentage of GDP. Now, the primary reason why that we've seen suboptimal rates of growth and export growth in particular is because of this particular slide. Sri Lanka's export basket has not diversified enough. In fact, this analysis which was done by Harvard University a few months ago shows that from 2000 to 2015, while in the export basket, China introduced 76 or Thailand 70 new products, Sri Lanka has introduced only 7, which has accounted for a relatively small percentage or absolute value of our export basket. Now, if you look at Thailand, for example, you would see a similar trend in countries such as Malaysia and Taiwan as well, where the blue line shows the market share that Thailand had in apparels and textiles which has increased and then subsequent declined and then the red line is Thailand's market share in electronic goods and the green line is Thailand's market share in machinery exports now let's look at the situation in Sri Lanka which is significantly different 
to that of Thailand and most of the other East Asian countries. We've had rapid growth in market share in apparels. However, it still remains significant and we've had negligible, if any, growth in our export basket of electronic and machinery products. Now, that's the first scenario as to leading up to my argument of why PPPs are relevant. The second aspect in ensuring a macroeconomic health for our country is foreign direct investment. Now, that again, whilst we do recognize that 26 years of war impacted our, impacted our FDI, that's not the only reason. We've had significant issues in ease of doing business. And these are statistics that are not exactly favorable for our country. Overall, our ease of doing business, Sri Lanka ranks 110. We are slightly ahead of India, but India has a large domestic market. If you are to become an export-oriented market, certainly we need to be better, but we are well behind East Asia and the Middle East. Sri Lanka is ranked 158 out of 181 under paying taxes, and we had 47 types of taxes compared to China's nine, and that's one of the reasons why we are ranked low. We rank poorly in terms of time taken to enforce a contract, and our fiscal balance position ranks 143rd out of 193 countries. Again, a not a healthy environment. Now, this is my last slide in terms of giving you a perspective on the country's economics. Let's look at net FDI as a percentage of GDP. This, uh, this slide again was done by Professor Ricardo Hausman of, 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 of Cornell University, sorry, uh, of Harvard University. And what Professor Hausman did was, in order to assess the real benefit of FDI is when you estimate net FDI and net FDI is fundamentally foreign equity inflows after netting out foreign debt. Now after you net out foreign debt and retained earnings invested by foreign companies, our net FDI as a percentage of GDP had a spike here as a percentage of GDP, it went up to about little under 3% and it flattened out during the period from around 2000 to 2015. Now seeing in the audience a few of my former colleagues at the Board of Investment, I'm particularly proud of this spike. That was the time I was chairman of the BO and I apologize if I'm not being too modest. This is the time where it's, it's quite ironic because I did, not, I did not know this statistic. When I discovered that at a time of war, in 1999, when Sri Lanka attracted a net equity FDI of $205 million, that that would be in 1999 the highest ever level of net FDI as a percentage of GDP. If someone said that, I wouldn't have believed it. Because what has happened is, post-war, when FDI figures are reported, it is reported with foreign loans added to it and retained earnings by foreign companies also added to it. So dialogue, for example, dialogue at Siata, which is a Malaysian company, if it borrows from a bank and invests $400 million in network expansion, that is counted as FDI. But that is, that is for reporting purposes, but that is not net FDI. So in fact, if you look at the net FDI position of Sri Lanka in 2016, it was little under $300 million. And that is not a satisfactory figure when in fact, uh, if you look at the uh, fact that in 1999 we achieved 205 million US dollars at a time when the country was plagued by a war risk premium. And what's also interesting to note is that if you look at the FDI figure in 1999, almost 50% of them were public private partnerships. That's the point I was trying to get at. The reason for this spike is the fact that somehow the management team of professionals in their 20s and 30s that I put together were able to implement PPPs and that included, as mentioned earlier, South Asia Gateway Terminal, which was a 200 million, 220 million dollar investment, Lanka Bell and Santel, which were in the several dozens of millions of dollars, the power projects where there was significant foreign investment, and finally, privatization. The proceeds from privatizing Sri Lanka Telecom, a transaction that I was involved with as chairman of the advisory committee that picked the financial advisor to privatize Sri Lanka Telecom, the entire $150 million that was raised was used to retire debt. 
along with the privatization proceeds from steel, from gas, from duty free and five or six other privatization proceeds. So this comes to my point in terms of establishing the fundamental necessity and the importance of PPPs in the country's fiscal position. The next point I want to move into is the fact that implementing public-private partnerships require skills that are not typically available in the public service. And I happen to be fortunate enough, though I started life as an engineer, I practiced industrial engineering only for six months and I moved on to into finance and, uh, and investment banking. So I had, a, I had a perspective of both the engineering, the mathematics of it, and the financial structuring and the financial engineering part of it. And if I were to look at the critical skills that are required for successfully implementing PPPs, I put as number one, negotiating skills. You don't have to be an engineer, you don't have to be an economist. If you are good at negotiating, negotiating, then you get the best deal for the country. Secondly, communication and PR. When we privatized Sri Lanka Telecom, when we part privatized the port, we had a very simple communication message. In Telecom, we said, do you want to wait two and a half years on average for a telephone line? In the case of the port, we said, we have one of the worst waiting times for ships. And do you ever want, to, or want the port to go on strike and therefore have our exports affected as a consequence? So we had a simple communication message. It was not about selling an asset. It was all about generating efficiency in that particular sector. Then research and public policy articulation, financial structuring and evaluation, a very, very important skill that is required. And the skill of risk allocation, I spoke to you about earlier about the requirement to allocate risk between the public sector and the private sector and legal structuring and coordination and when to bring a PPP project to the Attorney General and external lawyers. Now, the professionals that handled the PPP projects at that time were paid close to market salaries. In fact, I had several senior officers of the Board of Investment saying, Mr. Vijay Singh, I think it's not fair. We are working for X salary. You are paying these people in their 20s and 30s a Y salary, which is X plus Y. So I told these particular officers, I have no problem. If you would like to resign from your public sector position, come on contract, where your contract would say that you will be terminated with one month's notice if your performance is not satisfactory. That is exactly how the staff was recruited for the PPP agency, PPP unit at the time. I said, by all means, uh, please, I will pay you the higher salary. Can you guess how many took up my offer? None. So that is what drove the point home. In other words, PPP is about setting up a performance-based culture and not sticking to tradition because every public-private partnership project is fundamentally different to the other. Now I'd like to touch upon one case study that shows you the right way of doing public-private partnerships <clears throat> and the wrong way. Let us take South Asia Gateway Terminals, for example. This was the first ever build-own transfer, build-own operate transfer transaction done in the entirety of South Asia. Now, when Queen Elizabeth Key was built, and when I did my research, I found Dr. Kulasing was involved in, in, in the port and imparted his engineering knowledge when QAQ was built. We had a competing proposal to expand QAQ. One was a loan from JICA, the Japanese lending agency. And the other one was a public-private partnership proposal from p Australia, UK, and John Keels Holdings. So my young team did an evalu evaluation. And we presented that to the Ports Authority and presented that to my minister, who happened to be the president at the time. And it was quite evident when the analysis was done that the public sector proposal if you were to compare the cost per TEU, 20 foot equivalent, which is the throughput of a particular port, the JICA proposal, the cost per TEU was two times two, two two 2.2 times higher, over two times higher than the private sector proposal. So not only would this country take a loan to repay the Japanese government, 
the cost of building that particular terminal was double that on a per TU basis than the private sector proposal. So when the analysis was presented, there was absolutely no way that anyone who argued on the basis of fundamental finance and fundamental economics that you could argue against the fact that the private sector proposal was more economically advantageous to the country. Now I mentioned earlier that the most important aspect of a PPP is your negotiating skills. So when the John Keyes proposal was first evaluated by the team, we looked at, we constructed a financial model and we looked at what were the revenue items that were going to accrue to the government at full capacity of the port. It was a forecast. And we found that the number was a little over $2 million. And then we studied the revenue sources of the Sri Lanka Ports Authority. And then we realized that the number was grossly inadequate. So then commenced eight months of intense negotiation. There were some shouting matches, yes. And this $2 million a year figure that would be the net revenue accruing to the Ports Authority from this PPP was negotiated to, I don't think anyone in the audience would guess what the number was finally, to $28 million a year. And today, I'm happy to say that if you look at the numbers of the Sri Lanka Ports Authority, Ports Authority makes a net revenue, actually it's net contribution, which goes straight to the bottom line, of over $30 million per year from South Asia Gateway Terminals and over $30 million from the CICT, the second PPP terminal per PPP project that's operating in the port. Now, what else happened? Never did the port go on strike, though the period prior to that there were intermittent strikes. Ship waiting time reduced by 90%. Now, let's look at how not to do a PPP or not to do a, a public sector investment and that is 180 degree corollary to SAGT and that's Hambantota. I'll just give you some statistics. A loan guaranteed by the government was taken at a value of about 1 billion US. If you look at the figure from 2012 to today, the accumulated loss by the Sri Lanka Ports Authority by virtue of the loan taken on the Hambantota port was, is 20 billion rupees, eroding the entirety of profits that the SLPA made from Colombo port activities. In fact, up to 2016, from the loan taken for the Hambantota port, the SLPA has paid $295 million in interest only, that is 40 billion rupees. Now, annual interest payments on the Hambantara loan is 4.5 billion rupees and over the next several years, if you look at the principal payments, in the next 4 to 6 years, a further 20 billion rupees has to be paid on the remaining loan principal outstanding of 950 million dollars. Now, let's rewind and see how differently we could have potentially done this transaction. If I had my way, which I didn't because I was not interested in public service, the Hambantara port should have been built where possibly the loan component would have been used to build the breakwater, which is what we call super infrastructure where the payback is more than 30 years. And that is what has happened in the Colombo port. The breakwater that you see jutting out 2.2 kilometers out to sea was built as a public investment. Let the terminals be then completed as a private investment with multiple port operators. And then the port authority could have very well taken 40-50% shareholding in the terminal and enjoyed the expansion of business because the public sector is not as good as mar at marketing as the private sector is. In fact, if you look at the port of Colombo, the reason for expansion of the port of Colombo to 4 to 4.5 million TUs, I'm not saying the SLPA is not marketing, it is really the marketing that has been undertaken by three different operators, SAGT, CICT and Port Authority and the market has grown and everyone is, has benefited because the port is run as on the principle of a common user port. So, therefore, if the port sector is to be taken as a case study on the next few points I'm going to make is that allocation of resources is critical in terms of generating economic activity. Now, 
What that also means is that when the state spends a dollar on building a project that does not give the required rate of return, there is a large opportunity cost to it. Now I wonder, in fact I was speaking to Mr. De Silva who is from the railways, what if the government had not spent the $1 billion on Hampantota port and spent only say $400 million on the breakwater and spent the balance $600 million electrifying the railway so that you had a high speed rail link between Colombo and Hampantota. It would have enhanced Hampantota's viability significantly more because when the Hamburg report was mooted when I was the chairman of the board of investment. I objected to it, yes, on the basis that unless there's a high speed road or rail link and Hamburg becomes an economic center, you are not going to have a viable port. Just to move on, there are other successful examples in, in public private partnerships where PPPs have been used to reform a particular sector. When the then Minister of Telecom who is now the Minister of Finance, decided that enough is enough in terms of waiting for an average two and a half years for a fixed telephone line. The strategy was very simple. First introduce competition through PPPs and I was brought into the scene and we brought in Lanka Bell and Santel. Simultaneously, let us look at finding a strategic investor for Sri Lanka Telecom. Now, you know how efficient the telecom sector is, but what we didn't realize at the time, there were many spin-off benefits from the reform that we undertook in the telecom sector and that was the growth of the software and the IT sector. When you have excellent telecommunication services, when you have very good port services, you cannot predict what other sectors of the economy will grow because these important sectors have become more efficient. So finally I come to the present and that is the setting up of the National Agency for Public-Private Partnership. Now, unfortunately, the BII that was set up uh, by me in 1996 became defunct a couple of years, a few years after my resignation. And I've learned my lessons from that. So I'm actually here in public service at the moment on a mission to create a far more transient and permanent structure so that public-private partnerships become ingrained within the public service. Whereas under the earlier model, there was a chairman, there was a board, there was a management team, governments change, chairmans change, political appointments are made and that becomes the end of PPPs and, and you would then witness declines in foreign investment. Now, in terms of lessons learned, I look at the lessons I have learned from the BII where the model was not sustainable and I look at the success of the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology which I had the privilege of co-founding when the Board of Investment gave the initial seed capital on a grant basis to start this not-for-profit institution. Why was SLIIT started? Now, let me explain why that succeeded and why the BII failed. I've already explained why the BII failed. You cannot have political interference. You cannot have people without the required qualifications implementing public-private partnerships. You get a suboptimum decision. You get resource misallocation. In the case of SLIIT, we created a structure as a company limited by guarantee where the government can only obtain a limited number of board positions and the entirety of the operations of SLIT is controlled by a majority of its members. Now we did not do that for selfish reasons because it's run as a public it, has, it is run as a not-for-profit organization. We did that because you do not play with education. We did that because we wanted to, as a fee living university, to maintain consistency, maintain standards. And to this date, 18 years later, we've been able to sustain SLIIT into being one of the most profitable educational institutes where every rupee that is earned as profits is reinvested back in this institution. So I'm making, I'm learning from these and hopefully in about a year or two when I move on to my private sector position, which is a lot more relaxed than what I'm having at the moment, I would have left behind a more sustainable structure. Now, in my journey, I'm being helped by quite a few donor agencies because the government has certain limitations in funding. So the World Bank has stepped in to assist the PPP agency. I will call it the NAPPP. And at the moment, we are hiring the required professionals. 
But there are significant bottlenecks. In my three months, I have realized that many ongoing public-private partnership projects are actually stuck. And they are stuck primarily because of the fact that the original guidelines that were created in the late 1990s for implementing PPP projects have been diluted and now the implementation of PPPs are classified under the 2006 procurement guidelines for goods and services, which are basically guidelines used for public tenders under the National Procurement Council. Now, I do not believe that PPPs can be efficiently implemented if they were to operate under the procurement guidelines as a public tender or if it comes under the National Procurement Guidelines. And therefore, I am in the process of looking at drafting a new set of guidelines in order that we are able to implement what I consider to be several billion dollars worth of investments that are possible in the PPP environment. Now, there are a few other aspects that I would be looking at in terms of creating the NAPPP as a proper legal structure. I will not comment on what sort of a legal structure it's going to be, but nevertheless, it's quite clear in my mind that investors and line ministries both are customers. And there must be a single facilitation and coordination point for the line ministries and, 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 and the investors. And also, in the last three months, when I was trying to work out how certain pro types of projects, which may not necessarily be viable to be implemented as PPP projects, in order to make them viable, with the government not having sufficient funds to invest, I came across a new terminology, which I had not heard to hitherto. I had heard about it, but I didn't know quite what it was. And that is called viability gap funding. Now, traditionally, when investments are being undertaken by the government, it is usually foreign aid or consolidated fund that makes the investment. In the case of the private sector, the choices are you have your equity, you have your loan from your commercial bank. However, for some reason, if you look at Sri Lanka's affordability levels or high interest rates, possibly that particular PPP, it might be in, 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 in renewable energy, it might be on a, in, in the case of a domestic aviation company. It may very well be that in the initial stages, this project is not viable by virtue of having high interest rates and, uh, and, and affordability factors. Now there are donor institutes who will give money directly into the enterprise themselves if we can demonstrate, if we follow a proper process and demonstrate that we require this vi viability gap funding. And they will evaluate this on a case by case basis and provide you with the necessary money. Now, I was quite surprised to learn that there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars of viability gap funding that is available in the world. Starting with the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, a, they have created an institute called the Sustainable Development Investment Program, where as long as a particular PPP project follows a strict process of satisfying sustainable development goals, they will provide you with viability gap funding from a minimum level of $20 million to a maximum of over $100 million. World Bank is providing me, or the NAPPP, starting from December this year, $25 million, of which some component can be used to hire experts, local or foreign, to require for a particular PPP transaction, and the other component can be used for viability gap funding. If these funds are successfully deployed, the World Bank has promised a further $200 million. And therefore, one need not be daunted by the fact that Sri Lanka has the potential to implement large-scale PPP projects. Now, it is quite tragic when you really consider that we have implemented in the last 20 years, since the first PPP was done by the team that I brought into the BUI, we've implemented only two projects in, PPP, in the PPP environment, more than 500 million US. And in most countries in, in the developing world, the 500 million US would be a small and medium industry. What are the two projects? The CICT terminal in the Colombo port and Port City. Now we need to be thinking big. And if you are to think big, we need viability gap funding. Because the Treasury, as I mentioned, 
earlier by virtue of our fiscal position does not have sufficient funding. So what is the rationale for the line ministries to work with us? There are certain line ministries, line ministries who are quite concerned that the PPP agency would take away some level of authority. No, I am not in this business to take away authority from any line ministry. I am in this business of guiding the PPP agency so that the line ministries can tap into whatever expertise that we can bring to complement the expertise of, of the line ministry, implementing pre-feasibility studies and also provide the support of the finance ministry where required because certain types of PPP projects might require some level of public funding in order to build some access roads or provide the utility infrastructure to the periphery of the site. Now, there are bottlenecks, yes. As I mentioned earlier, the procurement guidelines, there is a requirement for new guidelines. There are significant bottlenecks in the Attorney General's department because they are overworked. There are extremely capable people in the AG's department. So I found a formula in the late 90s to overcome that hurdle, which I'm hoping I can replicate. And that is, I went and literally pleaded with the then Attorney General, please second to me, transfer on a full-time basis two or three of your cleverest young lawyers from the AG's department to the BII, and he did. And they did some of the best work. I also received approval where necessary to hire international lawyers along with local lawyers, private lawyers. If I were to ex give you two examples, PPP agreements are extremely complex. The SAGT PPP agreement runs into over a thousand pages. It took four months to just write the relevant agreements. The Port City PPP agreement runs into over 400 pages. So the negative is, again as I was mentioning, public-private partnerships take time. So there have been periods in our country where people have taken the easy route. The easiest route to take is, oh, we have a project there. Let's get a loan from some international country, India, China, Japan, wherever. Give a government guarantee, call for tenders and build the project. Well, that's what has got us into trouble in the first place. We have built too many of these projects that have not generated sufficient returns on return to the economy. So the key message I have for the engineers and those who represent line ministries here is that we are here to facilitate. We are a brain trust of what I call financial engineers. I love the terminology of financial engineers. So they are not real engineers. And we are also, in my view, what I call the third force of investment mobilization and capital formation. You have the private sector who will invest, you have the public sector who will invest, we are that third force who will forge the best of both worlds to implement certain projects. And of course, we are also there as a watchdog to see that line ministries allocate risks in an equitable manner that is not harmful to the fiscal position of the country or the country's balance sheet. To the final part of my presentation, and that is the role of engineers. I believe I would like, I, I believe Dr. Arthur C. Clarke in 2001, when he wrote a felicitation on Dr. Kulasinghe, he actually had this to say. Dr. Kulasinghe's career spanned not only over half a century, but it also covered a wide range of specializations from civil, mechanical and electrical engineering and naval architecture to renewable energy technologies and manufacturing institutions and manufacturing. Institutions under his leadership work closely with both the public and private sector institutions in solving problems, thus helping local industries to be cleaner, leaner and more competitive. Therefore, with the permission of the President of the IASL, I'd like to confer on Dr. Kulasinghe as the pioneer of PPPs in this country, because that is precisely what a PPP is in, 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 the, in the strict sense of the definition. I also believe that Dr. Kulasinghe was pioneer of another sphere that is somewhat lacking in our country, because we've been living beyond our means over the last 10 to 15 years. And that is why we are not seeing the peace dividend in terms of rapid economic growth of 8% GDP plus. And that is, I believe that Dr. Kulasinghe was also one of the initial practitioners of 
what is commonly called engineering economy. Now, engineering economy is the approach of finding amongst many alternatives the best choice in monetary terms, in financial terms, and even from an engineering standpoint. It's the fusion of both engineering optimization and financial optimization. I love the word optimization because I'm an industrial engineer. So then when you look at the history of the creations of Dr. Kulasin, low cost water boiling using solar energy, 1950s I believe, crop drying machine using solar energy, uh, a, a garbage recycling plant in the Manning Town Market Complex. So therefore, his curiosity, investor zeal, I believe was honed during a time of economic inequality that prevailed during the British. Then we went into a period of import controls and a closed economy during the 1970 to 77 period. And then in 1978, we moved towards an open economy. As in the case of any inventor in any country, not all invent inventions are successful. Some of Dr. Kulasinger's inventions did not survive market competition. And that is perfectly rational. But they were born out of a necessity because of the era that he lived in, because of the times that he lived in. If I were to take the 1970-77 period, which was a period of scarcity, import controls, exchange control. I can think of one other individual who, like Dr. Kunasinga, I now again confer him the title of being a pioneer in engineering economy, who was a pioneer in architectural economy. I'll give you three guesses, I'm sure most of you will guess. Yes, Mr. Jeffrey Bauer. I believe, this is my personal view as a, as a, as a as, as someone who is fascinated with architecture, as, as a real estate developer. Mr. Jeffrey Bauer's architectural philosophy was fostered and nurtured in a period of scarcity. And that is what I believe led him towards economy in architecture and he is now referred to as the father of modern tropical architecture. Studied by people from all parts of the world. In fact, I have some friends in India who literally revere Jeffrey Bauer. So, let's look at a few other aspects of the role of engineers. I would like to touch on what areas of engineering that we have performed best in an open economy era. And I, I believe we as Sri Lankans must look at the world stage and not necessarily being competitive or being considered to be competent and clever within our own narrow confines of a population of 21 million people. Prime in that particular category, I believe, is the ICT sector, the software sector. This is one area where exports were less than $5 million in 1996 when we decided to set up SLIIT to today reaching a billion US dollars in exports, growing at an average of 20% compound annual. There is no other service industry or manufacturing industry in Sri Lanka over the last 20 years that has grown at that rate. Secondly, the telecom industry. Post-liberalization, the taxes paid by the telecom industry have grown more than 100-fold. So why not privatize? Because when you expand the industry, the tax base grows. We have industrial chemical mechanical engineers in apparel. I didn't realize that you need physicists and chemical chemists and mechanical engineers to manufacture a, a bra that is uh, Victoria's Secret. Um, now if you take the sphere of civil engineering, I think the performance is somewhat mixed because there are not too many civil engineering companies that have entered the global stage generating value. I emphasize the importance of generating value. If you look at a Sri Lankan founded company, the first Sri Lankan founded company to reach a billion dollar valuation is Virtusa, founded by Sri Lankans, run largely by Sri Lankans. Now John Keyes Holdings, which was founded by the British, 
took a century to hit a billion dollar market capitalization valuation. In the case of Vertusa, it was a short period of under 15 years. Now, yes, there are dynamic engineering companies who have ventured overseas. We have Sunken, we have Lanka Transformers, we have EcoPower in, in hydro generation. But there are disappointments. The state-owned corporations. What has happened to the state engineering corporation? The state development and construction corporation, where respectively Dr. Kulasinga and my father were chairman of. I had the privilege of meeting the current chairman of SEC. Unfortunately, SEC still gets bailed out by the Treasury. Now, the petroleum sector. Now, here's my point. If you look at state-owned enterprises that are in civil engineering from China, I have dealt with China Merchant, I have dealt with China Harbor, I have dealt with several other companies. Their asset base is more than the GDP of Sri Lanka. They are state-owned. But what is the difference? They are run on private sector principles. And it is a meritocracy that allows who is going to be president or CEO of that company and who is going to be on the board. Yes, they receive certain guidance from the state. But ultimately the board is appointed in a manner where it is the day-to-day the, the -day decision making is left to be done in a manner that private sector companies make decisions. So, if I were to just quickly run through where I think the billions of dollars are going to come from, this is the, my wish list, the PPP project pipeline, which I am hopeful that will keep many engineers busy over the next few years, if I can get them to fruition where the first rupee is invested on the ground. I will not go into uh, details on this. Uh, there is in the transport sector, inland water transport, elevated highway from New Calgary Bridge to Atrugiriya, there is a highway monetization project, LRT, the marine drive extension via an underground tunnel to Port City. And in the port sector, East Terminal, the Hambantara port, there are further investments to be made in Hambantara port apart from the billion dollar PPP that was signed recently. In the power sector, there is waste to energy, LNG Karavalapitya, FSRV terminal, renewable energy projects. In the water sector, now you can argue, water, surely, how can you do PPP projects? Because the tariff that water is sold as in, is only 12 rupees and the cost of water is probably 60 rupees. Now here is my point, because the government cannot continue to fund water projects from its capital budget due to the restrictions that we have, we have on, on borrowing imposed in part by the Treasury and imposed in part by the IMF. Certain types of investments have to be migrated from being capital investment projects to be invested via operating budgets of, of these organizations. So if the private sector invests in a water project, yes, it is not viable in the strict sense of a port project where the revenue get, you get is sufficient to meet your costs and give a return to the private sector. In that situation, the government would have to pay what is called an annuity payment. So therefore, the government does not incur a capital expense but it incurs an annuity expense over a period of 15-20 years in order to make that project happen. So it is taken out of the capital budget and put into the recurrent budget. Then one can argue, okay, will our recurrent budget get out of control? Not if those projects are properly implemented, analyzing quantitative economic returns and not if our tax revenues increase over time as the overall economy grows. So certainly in my view, when you reach a situation where you cannot borrow any further, you must evaluate the projects that much more rigorously when you decide on capital allocation. Next we have special economic zones. The Colombo International Financial City is going to be a special economic zone for services, including financial services, hotel, retail, etc., residences. Hambantara will be a special economic zone for export-oriented industries. Then petroleum. I am not going to touch too much upon uh, uh, some of these because these are at very preliminary stages. Then, yes, it is possible to do PPP projects in social infrastructure. Land. 84% of the land mass in this country is owned by the state. And in my view, a piece of land belonging to the state that is idle is a liability to the state and not an asset. Why? Because you have to pay for security guards, you have to worry about encroachment. 
and therefore releasing these lands in a rational manner for affordable housing, IT parks, vast amounts of degenerated lands are available in Ampara and Polonaro districts and even Monrabil districts can be released for agribusiness. Education can be done on PPP basis. Health. At the moment, the PPP agency is working on about 30 import substitution pharmaceutical manufacturing projects. And of course, in tourism, inland air transport, I have had extensive discussions with the Air Force and the Civil Aviation Authority to ascertain whether a PPP project can be done where we use the domestic airports, we ring fence the military activities, but the rest of it will be operated under civil aviation rules for a private sector company to run a scheduled service connecting the main airports that are within the tourism zones. This has been something that I have been talking about for probably 20 years. Sri Lanka has rich mineral resources which we are yet failing to exploit in an environmentally sustained manner. I emphasize the word environment. We have an environment law in the country. Yes, the studies show that we have hydrocarbon deposits. So therefore, starting today, when we look at our natural gas deposits and our LNG strategy, we've got to plan today in order to be able to ensure that the downstream and the logistics involving both natural gas and LNG is optimized. We have phosphate sufficient to be self-sufficient for the next 200 years and possibly even export the excess. And we are not exploiting this in an environmentally sustainable manner. We have graphite and we have mineral sands. So when you look at this pipeline of projects, I have to ask the question, why is it that our GDP growth rates remain at suboptimal level? Now, that is the message that I would like to leave with in terms of what it takes for all of us to be stakeholders in generating greater levels of public-private partnerships and private investment. And that requires a mindset change because we are living in challenging times. Now, if engineers are to become true stakeholders in PPPs, I have summarized some key requirements. And these include understanding fully the economic concept of scarcity. Increasingly, the gap between the economic wants and needs and the resources to fulfill these are expected to increase over time. The resource allocation process needs to be transparent, competitive, devoid of external influences to have an accurate price discovery process. I must emphasize that every single PPP that I implemented from 1996 to 2001 at the BOI was competitively sourced. There was not a single unsolicited proposal that I accepted. So therefore, implementing PPPs in a manner that is that, that allows you to price discover, get the most efficient investment, minimizing the cost to the state is extremely important. Development of infrastructure sustainably with new concepts of engineering economy, which I touched on earlier, being embraced boldly. And finally, engaging in competitive behavior, be entrepreneurial in your thinking, understand that competition is, true, is a true driver of innovation, efficiency, and I, I need to be emphasizing this over and over again, the importance of optimum resource allocation. I mentioned at the beginning of my speech that I've been very proud to have an extended family of engineers. I have the highest respect that I, I have of what I see world-class engineers operating in various parts of the world. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I have not had my share of disagreements with the engineering profession. And that is invariably because I was able to justify my position by numbers, not engineering numbers, economic and financial numbers. Yes, I had my disagreements with engineers on the South Asia Gateway Terminal project, where engineers from the port vehemently argued that, oh, it's better that we get a loan from Japan and continue on our investment via the port, Sri Lanka Ports Authority. I beg to differ. I had my disagreements at the time when we had short-term power prices, when emergency power was purchased by the CEB. I gave a dissenting report as a member of the power committee. Nevertheless, my voice was not heard. 
the CEB went ahead with emergency power purchases at a great cost to the country. There were all cheaper alternatives. And we seem to be heading in the same direction at the moment. Whilst I'm not saying that there are cheaper alternatives, I'm, 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 I, 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 today's era is, is, I'm not casting any aspersions on anyone, anybody here. Um, I've had disagreements on the Colombo Hatunag Expressway. I was a member of the TEC that awarded the project to Kenya. I was the only non civil engineer, I believe, in that TEC, but I wrote a dissenting report. It was the wrong decision. I refused to sign on the TEC forms and resigned from the TEC. Again, I believe I was proven right because KNM did not have the resources to complete the project at the price that it quoted. And the project was abandoned with the government paying, I would say, tragically wrongly liquidated damages to KNM to walk away from the project, leaving a valley Khanda behind. So, my message is that true engineers are true economy engineers, where you evaluate the project for its larger merits beyond your basic propensity, your basic motivation to control. I think letting go, allowing dissent, allowing competing opinions to thrive is how you achieve efficiency and economic growth. So on that note, I would like to leave you with some tight final thoughts of quotations from initially Dr. Arthur C. Clarke. The world needs uninhibited un thinkers, not afraid of far out speculations. That was Dr. Kulasing. It also needs hard headed conservative engineers who can make their dreams come true. There are many of those. They are all needed. They complement each other. And progress is possible, impossible without both. We must be open to conflicting views. Then the well-known Hungarian engineer and mathematician, Theodor von Kármán said, scientists discover the world that exists and engineers create the world that never was. Now what I'm trying to do in my small way in the National Agency for Public-Private Partnership, just to make sure that the financial resources being used to create this world that never was is optimally allocated and the state and the private sector work as true partners in implementing PPPs. And that's the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Jason. On your broad insight into successful implementation of PPP projects and the concept financial engineer, so as the role of engineers into it. Now I kind of call upon engineer, the president, engineer Javila Meegoda, to hand over the top of appreciation to Mr. Vijay Singh. Thank you. The time for vote of thanks by engineer MNE Samar, Chairman of Civil Engineering Section of Health. Good evening. President IESL, <coughs> Engineer Jayavil Almi Goda. President elect for session 2017-18. Engineer Professor Nanjani Ratnayaka, Past Presidents, Vice Presidents, Council Members, Guest Speaker Mr. Tilam J. Singer, Relatives of Dr. A.N.S. Kula Singer, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to deliver the word of thank at the memorial oration of great engineer Dr. A.N.S. Kula Singer. Today, today is 98th birth anniversary also. Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka jointly organized this event with Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. This is an annual event of IESL calendar to respect the great engineer and past president of IESL. I am happy to see here the fully packed engineers 
and others present here to honor the eminent engineer Dr. Ernest Klosinger. Dr. Klosinger was a practical engineer who spent most of his time in the field than in the comfortable air condition office. His career starting from the hydro electricity field spread into other areas making vast contribution to many leading institutions. The secret of Dr. Klesinger's success was his positive attitude and can-do approach blended with excellent communicating skills and clear and logical thinking. A true sense of patriotism, love and compassion toward his fellow men and uncompromising moral stand, standards among others were his other traits. He was not only an excellent engineer but also a scientist, technologist, teacher and mentor to many Sri Lankan. He is a musician and a good tabla and flute player also. For the Dr. Kulasinga's memorial lecture, we have invited Mr. Thilan V. Singh as a guest speaker and he happily accepted our invitation, came here and delivered the lecture on the relevance of public-private partnership PPP and the role of engineers. Mr. Thilan is the chairman acting CEO of the newly created National Agency for Public-Private Partnership. Mr. Thilan is an exemplary leader of both private and public sector organization and also a successful entrepreneur and angel investor. I think because of this reason Mr. Thilan has selected this topic today. The topic is very relevant to Dr. Kulasinga also. He practices this concept in his career span. I hope you all enjoyed and benefited from Mr. Thilan's speak. I don't know about your discipline in engineering, but in your own word, I can call you as a financial engineer. <laughs> thank you very much. I have to, on behalf of ISL, thank you very much, Mr. Tilan Vijay Singh, for accepting our invitation and delivered the wonderful lecture here. I have to thank our president engineer, Javil Al Migoda, for his guidance and encouragement to organize this seven success. Participation of Dr. Kulasinga's family members added more value on this occasion. Thank you very much for your presence here. President-elect, vice presidents and council members of ISR, ISL are here and your participation is valuable. Thank you for your presence. Dear friends, without your presence here, this event is not successful. Your presence gave us more energy to organize such events in future also. Thank you very much for spending your valuable time and participate in this event today. Finally, officers at ISR Secretariat, especially CEO and Executive Secretary Engineer Neil Abe Segara and his staff uh, worked hard for the success of this event. Thank you very much, Engineer Neil and your staff. Thanks again for you all for your participation for the successful event. Thank you.